Hey everybody, it's John Schnepp and you are watching Heroes. It's episode 21 and we are ready to rock and roll and talk about all the superhero crazy news that happened this week. And with me as always, John Campia. For our special four hour episode, you thought last week's three hour episode, strap in, go to the bathroom, use an empty Coke bottle, we're ready to roll. Yeah, and, and back as a special guest is the one and only Robert Meyer Burnett. Thanks for coming back. Thank you, thank you, John. Thank you, John. Great to be here. I love being here. Well, let's let's start it off. Let's get right into some news. Uh, number one, we are going to talk about Civil War. Uh, this past weekend, uh, D23, they they promoted the sizzle reel. We've also seen pictures of Black Panther skimping around buildings. Uh, we've seen we've heard that Spider Man is back. They got Tom Holland. He's he's now part of the cast. A lot of Civil War news broke out. Let's start off with the only man sitting at this table actually was <laughs> at D23 and saw the sizzle reel. John. What did you see and tell everyone what you saw? Well, okay, well, there are two big things that Marvel came out to produce. And it's funny because for the live action panel, which was uh, Disney Motion Pictures, Lucasfilm, and Marvel, they led off with Marvel. So Kevin Feige comes out and he talked about two films. He talked about Captain America Civil War, talked about Doctor Strange. We'll get to Doctor Strange in a little bit. And they, they pulled together this, it's not a trailer per se, but they just took a bunch of footage, slapped it together, made like a three or maybe four minute, I can't remember how long it was, sizzle reel for it. And it was tons of fun. Tons of fun. Now, if you heard us talk about on Movie Talk the other day, one thing Mark Ellison was a little bit weird, weirded out about, and I can understand where he's coming from, is that it doesn't really look like civil war. More like a civil discussion or a civil dispute. <laughs> it's like, it doesn't really look like these two sides are enemies. It's just like, one side's, ah, we got to kind of follow orders. We got to yeah, stop you from doing this. So yeah, well, we got to do it anyway. So it's not really... This whole idea, Rob and I, we were talking about during lunch, this whole idea of these of these two paradigms reflecting these two opposite philosophies and whatever. It's, it doesn't really feel like that's going to be it. It's going to be something a little bit toned down. But don't mistake that for me saying that the scissor still wasn't great. It was a lot of fun. It was really cool. And I said this on Movie Talk, I'll say it again. What stole the show, though, is the last 30 seconds. Because there's no Paul Rudd in the entire sizzle reel till this end part where they find his van from Ant-Man, open it up, and he's sleeping in his van now. And he's meeting Captain America for the first time, and it's just 30 full seconds of Paul Rudd tripping over himself, geeking out because he's meeting Captain America. And that, mm -hmm. and it was absolute hilarity. The other thing that really stood out to me, and I did not mention this on Movie Talk, actually, Mark didn't either, and I'm, I'm slapping myself that we didn't. The other really interesting thing about that sizzle rig is he got a glimpse of Black Panther and Captain America and Iron Man, all that kind of stuff. No Spider-Man. Not a reference, not a hint, not anything of Spider-Man. Now, on one hand, it kind of makes sense because I do believe we're all assuming he's going to play a pretty small role in this film. But the other thing was, if they're bringing us footage that is done, that is prepared then they were already shooting the movie a long time before they ever cast Tom Holland to go in there and start playing, which also lends itself to the fact that it's going to be a pretty small role. So absolutely no glimpse of Spider-Man in it. Uh, the Civil War, Civil Dispute, more, more like, there's this one scene where, you know, you see Captain America's guys and Iron Man's guys running at each other in a back alley, and it felt more like the, uh, the West Side story than anything else. Two sides running at each other, and they start fighting. So you got Black Widow fighting, uh, uh, fighting a bulls Bullseye, fighting a Hawkeye, and Hawkeye's got her down on the ground. She goes, but we're still friends, right? And he's like, oh, yeah, yeah dinner Saturday or whatever. And it's funny. So it felt kind of weird, but still, overall, it felt really exciting, high intensity. It was really, really cool to see. What do you think about this? Well, you know, I think this is my most eagerly awaited Marvel film aside from the first Avengers. And I love the Civil War storyline. I mean, the, they really, it was an epic storyline, but really at its core was this disagreement. It was a disagreement between two of the, 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 the pinnacle, the pantheon of all Marvel heroes. I mean, Steve Rogers and, and Tony Stark are the guys. I mean, arguably the men. They're human beings at heart. They're they're from Earth. They're not meta humans, really, right. and they really had a disagreement that exploded across the Marvel universe, and it had epic consequences. And I think after the Russo brothers directed Winter Soldier, I don't think they're going to go small and make it comedy. Or I think it's going to mm, yeah. I think it's going to be dire. And I think we're going to see these guys. I think it's going to tear the audience apart the way it tore the comic audience apart. Remember, the, the ad line was, whose side are you on? And I, I was on Tony Stark's side. But I, I, I think that people are going to be surprised by this movie, and I think they're going to come out. It's going to be like um, 
indecent proposal. You know, would you allow somebody to sleep with your wife if they gave you a million dollars? I think people are going to come out of this movie going, whose side were you on? Did you believe in Tony Stark or did you believe in Steve Rogers? I think that's what they're going to do. They're going to start that discussion. And I think people are not, they're going to be arguing even after the credits roll. Well, it's, it's, I hope it's a uh, it's interesting because like after hearing about like from uh, from Mark and your perspective on the footage that you saw, like that one sequence with Black Pan Black Widow and uh and Hawkeye fighting kind of jokey has that little like Joss Whedon like snippy like oh, yeah. here's a button on this scene kind of the one the one moments the, those mo few moments in Age of Ultron that I didn't like were those extra jokey elements because it it just takes you out of the film. and You're like, all right, this is nothing is there's no real stakes because everybody's joking around. I wonder if that's early on, if those scenes are early on, even that, that scrimmage match that you're talking about, them fighting each other, I don't even know if that really has anything to do with the Civil War. That could be a training sequence or something. They're fighting each other for some totally other, other reason. Because to have that kind of jokey mentality, I agree, if that's actually them really fighting and they're tossing jokes around, I don't like that. But if it's for some other reason, it's like pulling the wool over your while they're showing you the scissor world, like that's not even what this is really about for them to go to a civil war is a whole other other thing but they're it's hard to say because we don't know the context of right. it so it might be like that this is the real fight and be, once we know the context a couple of the characters dropping jokes here and there might make right, perfect sense it's, right. and that's one of the hard things when even the sizzle reel we saw was completely out of context of anything else. And we just don't know what's happening. And going back to your point about wondering about, you know, if people are gonna come out of this film, you know, still discussing, well, we're on Tony's side. I think the name of the movie is Captain America uh, Civil War. Right. I think they're going to paint this picture where Captain America is the 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 tower, if you will, of virtue and and more morality and what is right you know sort of thing and i think there'll be some discussion in there but i think at the end of the day it's going to be steve or not steve Rogers, it's going to be tony stark going cap was right all along or, or something like it that it feels I just that way he's going to do that because uh, tony stark already screwed up in age of ultron he created ultron he's already going against what people say hey we're a team you're not operating on a team level you're just doing what you think's right look what you've done already twice now with ultron being the second time i you know what I think it might be called Captain America Civil War because of what's going to happen at the end. The cost of a civil war, mm. brother against brother. The very term comes from American history. It was one of our darkest periods. And if anyone's read the comic, you know what happens at the end of Civil War, and it ain't good. And so yeah. I think as the Marvel movies set up and move into the Infinity War, right. I think people might they're going to be surprised. And I, I see, I think this is going to be the most epic. I mean, the Avengers are epic on a large scale, but this is going to be epic. This is going to tear people apart emotionally. The audience is going to be torn apart emotionally, more so than any other Marvel movie. And I'm, I'm going to bring some tissues. I, I was going to remember, say, remember, bring the I'm bringing some clean. But remember, though, they're, they're like, uh, it's in the comics, so really we should be able to discuss it without being spoiled. But for the sake of anybody who doesn't know the Civil War comic, there is a key event which Rob is alluding to. But keep in mind, and you're all going to guess what it is anyway when I say this, but Chris Evans is signed on for Infinity War Part 1 and 2 and has already talked about how he's already cleared his schedule to be for his shooting of Infinity War Part 1 and 2. And so I, and you know, we had a discussion with the Russo brothers and I, while they never gave anything, they didn't divulge anything, it was my distinct impression from our discussion with them that Steve Rogers isn't going anywhere and, and uh, Captain America isn't going anywhere. Chris Evans is coming back for Infinity War. I don't think, there's going to be a lot of things different in the movie. We already know this. There's going to be a lot of things different in the movie than there were in the, in the, in the comics. If for no other reason that there's going to be a lot of characters that just can't be in it. Right. Um, and so, but who knows? We also cannot dispel the possibility, as much as we've, we've heard, no, Chris Evans is on, he's going to be back, the Bruce, whatever, the, that this could all be a big red herring, a sure. big misdirect to set up some big, huge surprise. It's that's possible. I don't think that's what they're going to do, but it's possible. Uh, look, I think we're going into Thor Ragnarok. I think I think that the Marvel universe is about to get. There's going to be a storm coming, just like at the end of Terminator. There's right. a storm coming, and we should all be saying, 
I know. It better not be genesis is all I, I can say. It's going <laughs> it's to be tough. I think it's going to be hard. You know what? Imagine if they just flip the script and Tony Stark's the one who dies on those steps. Look, if you haven't read it, Captain America dies in the comic books. Get with it. I'm not going to. He's okay. assass- that's what, I, that's what I was trying to yeah. dance He's a, around. He is assassinated. I was to dance Sorry, that. if you haven't heard about that, you shouldn't even be watching this show. <laughs> but so, in true Marvel fashion, don't worry. He always comes back. Yeah, he comes back. He was but gone in a very for a interesting while. Way. You know, in a I weird love, Alex Ross silvery outfit. So, okay. <laughs> well, I love Star Trek too. I cry at the end of it every time I watch it, even though I know Star Trek 3 is coming. I thought you didn't like Darkness. Enter Darkness. Whatever oh, that is. Really? Yeah, he had to <laughs> you cried at the end of he Star Trek? I cried at the end of Star Trek into Darkness. Darkness for a whole different reason. <laughs> I cry that my whole life was just gone, swept away. <laughs> All right, that was a cheap shot. Go ahead. It was. No, I was just going to say that, that I, I think this movie is going to be, it's going to pack an emotional wallop like none other, no other Marvel movie yet. Well, I, I certainly so. hope so. That would be great. Let's talk about another emotional wallop that happened. It's called The Fantastic Four. <laughs> uh, I'm just calling this Aftermath because let, let's be serious. Fantastic Four Aftermath. Yeah, I mean, this was a film that already we'd been hearing about for over the over a year before it even came out. We'd been hearing about set problems and issues, and it was pushed. Then it was coming out in August. Then we heard all about, you know, we saw the trailers, and, and both John and I were like sort of, when we first talked about it, I think it was about two years ago. Yeah. You were you coined it the Fantastic Four babies. Yeah, I had heard about uh, you know the oh the, I had heard some inside scoop that Annihilus and the Negative Zone was going to be in there and they were going to have Doctor Doom and it was going to be this whole other thing and but it was going to be a lot darker and then we didn't really know anything. Then cut to the first trailers came out looked pretty promising. We're yeah. like wow, that looks like a weird creepy horror movie take on the Fantastic Four. <laughs> then. Uh, Trank and Kin- Kinberg did an interview and talked about like the you know the influences of Cronenberg and trying to make this darker sci-fi yep. thing. It's and, gonna be the fly. Yeah, so it was yeah. like hearing that and then seeing that next trailer it had that tone and that flavor. So we we're I for I could speak for both of us. We we're kind of a hundred percent on board to be like, well, look, we're not gonna judge it till it comes out. Then about a week before the movie came out, a, a two weeks before the movie came out, no screenings, no press. One week before the movie came out, no screenings, no press until like I think it was like a twelve hours before the film. Yeah, it was they, when the was when the embargo was going to be lifted. They weren't screening it for uh, critics until the day before the film opened, and that's when we said on the show, "Hey, remember how Fox spent a year getting us on board, getting us excited? They just undid it all." Because I was preaching for a year, Fantastic Four is going to be great. You got a good writer, you got a great director, you got a great cast. That you got the studio that gave us X Men: Days of Future Past. For heaven's sakes, this movie is going to be awesome. And then with one week to go, we had to get on our show and say, "Take all that and throw it out the window." Right. Fox just sent up a flare in the air that said that they don't believe in this movie. So you can pretty much take it to the bank. This movie is going to be terrible. Yeah. And <laughs> well, uh, as far as for from my perspective, the first hour of it was actually really interesting and felt like a different. If it wasn't called the Fantastic Four, I would have loved it. It was like, hey, I'm watching a crazy, weird horror film about these kids who go to another dimension and get these weird powers. And then a year later happened on the screen and you're like, what's going on here? They had some weird transformational body horror stuff. Read Richard Skimps away, weird jump cuts. All of a sudden it doesn't, I don't know what I'm watching. Dr. Doom shows up, has head exploding powers, then doesn't. Like he could have blown up Reed, Reed Richards' head. I've never it's like, understood that. Like he spends his first yeah. five minutes on screen, blow up your head, blow up your head, blow up your head. I'll be with you. Ah! Yeah, with you, I'll Let's take you to this other cups. planet and float around. And it's like, <laughs> So it became a completely different film. And when I say a different film, I mean a piece of garbage film, a horrible, everything that happened up until that point unraveled while you're watching it. None of it's making sense while you're watching it happens so quick. And then it ends. And boy, does it have a, it had an ending that I can only relate to the original Roger Corman Fantastic Four film where Reed and Sue get married and you see a rubber arm like this at the very end, hanging out of the limousine. That's how this Fantastic Four ended, in a garbagey, trashy, jokey way where they're given a brand new facility. I mean, it just, they took that whole first hour and then just threw it into the, the wastebasket is how it felt. It was really a, a, a hard film to, to watch for myself because I grew up, that was my first, my first comic book was the Fantastic Four because I was into monsters and where monsters dwell. And so my dad got me the Fantastic Four, which was basically monsters fighting other monsters and that's that's what got me into the whole superhero thing so 
to see this being the fourth iteration of the Fantastic Four, if you haven't seen the Roger Corman film, it's on YouTube. You can check that out or get a DVD. It's really easy to find. The other two uh, were kind of jokey comedy versions of the Fantastic Four. Just none of the jokes worked and it was just poorly done, poorly executed. They had a great cast as far as like, you know, and they had a big budget. It just was all wasted. So those felt like big commercials to sell toys or something. But, you know, it's been the it's been the fallout of it. That's been interesting because we've we've reviewed this yeah. film ad nauseum many times already. And but it's. It's gonna be. This is gonna be a case study for people who want to study film history at some point. Is oh, yeah. what went on with Fantastic Four? Because I remember watching that movie, and I didn't think the first half was all that bad. I didn't particularly really enjoy the first half hour, but I really didn't think it was all that bad. I remember Dennis and I were sitting together watching it at Fox Studios and thinking, "What is?" Because we had heard people who saw it that morning. We saw the evening screening. There was a morning screen. We heard people saw, saw it from the morning saying, "This is garbage." Mm -hmm. So we're watching, thinking. I, I, what were they talking about? This isn't all that bad. And then it takes a slow descent into hell. But I remember thinking, watching it, okay, the same director who gave us Chronicle. And Chronicle, when you sit down and watch that movie, that is a movie that is forget powers. That movie is so character-based, yeah. it's insane. It's about these characters and the dynamics of their relationships and how those relationships evolve. And now, what's causing the dynamics to evolve? The power, superpower, blah, blah. yeah, but those were all side issues. It was character-driven. All relationship, all character, all the time to the end credits. And about halfway through this film, I remember thinking, you know, other than a little bit of chemistry between Reed and Ben, which there was a little bit there, right. Where's the character development? Where, how, where's the relationship? The, the relationship between Reed and Johnny Storm? There is no relationship between Reed and Johnny Storm. There, there was no, other than a quick glancing look at each other between Sue and Reed, I felt no developing, possibly budding romance there whatsoever. And I remember sitting there thinking, what? happened this can't be the same director and then we started to hear all the stories about well we'd heard about them before but the stories about how fox came in they hijacked the film right. they totally did all this kind of stuff and suddenly now as i'm watching the movie i'm thinking this all makes sense right. because this was not the movie i had you know thought it was going to be this this, this isn't directed by the same guy who directed chronicle like i, I just and then everything just fell to pieces. What we, we haven't had a chance. We've reviewed the film a couple of times. What was your reaction to Fantastic Four? Well, to be honest with you, I haven't I seen it, it yet. Oh, well, no. no but you, are the, you are the object of our envy. But, but see, here's the thing that I, I don't understand. With the comic book films that are coming out, has uh, Marvel has set the tone. Right. When they've gone back to their actual... This, the Civil War is based on a comic story. Age of Ultron, not so much, but it's still Age of Ultron. There was a comic that preceded the film. Mm -hmm. The John Byrne run of Fantastic Four from the 80s is so iconic, and it deals with everything you're talking about. It deals with character, relationships, but it also has amazing cosmic uh, storylines where they're tra traversing dimensions, and there's Galactus comes back, and there's the Silver Surfer. There's just this amazing stuff going on. Why don't they go back to the, why don't they take a cue from Marvel and go to the comic books? I mean, Winter Soldier was based on Brubaker's Winter Soldier run. Well, I'll be uh, to be fair, this is based on the comic books. This is based on the Ultimate Fantastic Four. It is based on the, but not what I mean. But that's not what the Fantastic Four was that we've talked about. Look, the Ultimate Galactus was a cloud. You know, I mean, right, come but, on. I mean, in the Ultimates, the Galactus was a bunch of insect. That's what I things. mean. And, and yeah, uh, so I mean, there's certain things you have to go back to. How far do you but mix I the think, 60s look, and the 80s and the 90s? But as we know, the, the greatest Fantastic Four movie that's been made is The Incredibles. Right. That's a movie yeah. that, that even though Pixar put their own spin on it, it caught the feeling, captured what, what the Fantastic Four always mm -hmm. were. I remember the first time I read a Fantastic Four comic was in the, the trade paperback Secret Origins of Marvel Superheroes I got in the mid-70s. And I love that yes. origin story. And and I just, I don't understand why they don't look toward those. Why are they always trying to change the Fantastic Four? It's the one superhero property where they're trying to move away and turn it into something else. Right. When Look at Guardians of the Galaxy, that tone could have been a great Fantastic Four movie. Well, I think you hit it on the head when you said those two words, John Byrne. Now, a lot of people don't know who John Byrne is now, but in the 80s, 
he's the guy with Chris Claremont who created the all new, all different X Men. He didn't create it with Dave Cockerman, uh, Len Wein. Those guys were the jumping off point, but Chris Claremont and John Byrne are the ones who put it on the map. And they did an incredible run, which is what a lot of like Days of Future Past are based on that. Uh, a lot of everybody's best memories and best characters are based off of that run of the X-Men. So John Byrne then jumped off and he's like, look, I want to write and draw my own comic. He took the Fantastic Four and took a comic book that at that time was kind of just floating around and existing and just put so much energy and took the love and dynamism of Stan Lee's writing and Jack Kirby's drawing and synthesized it into something that was mind blowing. For me as a kid is when I started reading those, I was reading Fantastic Four, like I said, since a little kid. And then as a younger kid, st still sticking with the Fantastic Four, I was like, ah, it's okay, Rich Buckler, you know, this, uh, I, I lived through that period when Power Man was actually one of the Fantastic <laughs> Four with George Perez. Um, but boy, did John Byrne just change everything. And this was like the mid, the early 80s to the mid 80s when a lot of our younger viewers won't know, won't remember this because they you were, didn't even exist yet. But that was like a, an incredible time to be a comic book fan. You had Howard Chaikin on The Shadow. You had Walt Simonson do, writing and drawing Thor. You had John Byrne writing and drawing The Fantastic Four. You had a Chris Claremont and Paul Smith doing The X-Men. I mean, it was just, I mean, it was, I mean, and you had Frank Miller's The Dark Knight. You had Alan Moore's Watchmen. You had, I mean, it was Marv just- Wolfman and Perez's Teen, Teen Titans. Titans. I mean, it was a relentless- amazing amount of incredible stuff happening. And that was just Marvel and DC. You also had the launch of First Comics. You had all these With independents. Jacob's American Flag. Yeah. I mean, and you it, had Star Slayer. You had Nexus. Jack. Yeah, I mean, all these different amazing comic books and just people being able to experiment and try different things. Some of it failed. Some of it's now around that you're used to. So I think that is the period of time that a lot of people, if you're not going back to the 60s, you should definitely go back to the mid 80s and take runs like exactly where they got Thor the Dark World's Malekith is from Walt Simonson's run on the 80s Thor. So that would be my tip to anybody who's taken the Fantastic Four and taken it wherever it's going to go next. Let's go back to those 80s John Byrne comic books. Just take any number of issues, just any three, and read them. It's a script right there. Well, well that, another thing is the, the color <clears throat> palette of the movie. I mean, I've seen enough. The Fantastic Four was always bright and vibrant and mm. big and colorful. The uniforms were electric blue, you right. know, with the big numbers. And this film just looks so dour. It's just so relentlessly dark and gray. And the, why? Like, why do that? Well, I mean, to be honest with you, it was it was it was a different take, a different spin. Sure. So look, I'm going to give it what it, it is. It didn't work. It doesn't work, but it was an attempt that was screwed up by the studio. I think if they let the director do what he was trying to do, which was a different take on the Fantastic Four. Which they agreed to let him do in right. the yeah. first place. They, they said, look, you're going to write it with your friend. You're going to direct it. We believe in you. You did Chronicle. Here's some money. Make us make us something that the fans will enjoy because they didn't like the, 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 the other two. Even though those made a lot of money, everybody's making fun of the Galactus Cloud and stuff. You do something different. Here's the ultimate Fantastic Four. And then not even halfway through, but like one third of the way through, we're going to pull it away, take all the scenes, the, all the action scenes out, hire a new dude to rewrite it, and then re replace you as a director, and also cut out like 20 to 30 minutes of your original stuff that had all this character development so the film doesn't make sense, and then the ending doesn't have anything to do with what you were trying to do. That's what it feels like when you watch the movie. I mean, you, you're watching some kind of insane, weird, you know, schizophrenic film that oh, is oh, not yeah. allowed to be what it is. Yeah. But so, here's 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 the big question that comes up now though, and this is the one I've been getting a lot of Twitter questions. Of. There, the I can't remember his name, but the president of domestic d distribution for Fox was asked, "Okay, so is this it then for Fantastic Four? And he <clears> said, <throat> "Well, look, we're clearly disappointed with with our results, but we are committed to Fantastic Four. And he's basically saying they're going to stick to that 2017 Fantastic Four two thing, and that's what he said. So the question I have for you guys is, and, and I'll answer it first, is, is Fox actually going to give us Fantastic Four 2? And in the words of Vince McMahon, no chance in hell. There's no way they're going to do this. I had a, a viewer on a Mailbag this weekend ask, hey, you know, Fox has got a history of they've botched a couple of movies, they botched a couple of X-Men movies, in a row, right. and they were able to turn that around. But the difference between those botched X-Men movies was good X-Men movies came before it, and even the botched X-Men movies made money. This one, 
Fantastic Four has no good Fantastic Four movies to, from behind it to which they can build off of, and this one is going to lose them the mansion. This is going to lose, this is, I read the Hollywood Reporter guesstimating 60 to 80 million dollars they're gonna lose. That's executive firing money when you let, lose that much money. I just cannot see anybody at Fox going to their boss at Fox and saying, hey, let's do Fantastic Four 2. Right. Are you effing kidding me? You just lost a $60 million. You lost all the hope in the world and all the faith from the fans. I, But Fox is still saying they're going to do it. Are we going to see Fantastic Four 2? Absolutely not. And here's, here's the writing on the wall for me. <clears throat> it's called The Amazing Spider-Man 2. Mm. Now that movie came out, didn't it make, it made almost a billion dollars. I think north of 700 million. Yeah, it was a giant hit. Huge moneymaker. Critically dragged through the garbage ringer, but it made a lot of money, enough so that they were like, we're starting a spider universe. We got Aunt May, we got uh, <laughs> the Sinister Six, we got Black Cat, we got Spider Woman, Spider Gwen, whatever we could think of. You know, you know we're gonna have like 800 different Spider-Man movies now. We got Venom, we got, I mean, remember that? That's what, that's what was going on when The Amazing Spider-Man 2, like a week or so before it even came out, they were like, we've got an entire spider universe, like an entire web of, the movie comes out, it makes a ton of money, but is a critical bomb. Like everybody was like, yo, this is like Batman and Robin, at least a lot of people. I hated it. But um Me too. Uh it, so that movie made a ton of money. And yet they were like, hang on a second, scratch all those sequels and all those prequels and all those spin-offs. We're not even gonna make Spider-Man three because we feel so embarrassed by the amount of of uh people saying how bad this film sucks that we're not going to continue with it. We're actually going to give it back to Marvel. Now, that's Sony. After they made a ton of money with Spider-Man, the Spider-Man franchise in general, like they had the amazing uh, Sam Raimi run, which was great, even, you know, discounting number three, some problems with it. Then you had the amazing Spider-Man, the first Mark Webb Spider-Man, which was okay. I love the yeah. first Mark Webb Spider-Man. Yeah. Actually, I, I unabashedly love that movie. Yeah. I thought it was great. I, I did too. But you know, the problem is you have the Marvel Studios movie, the, M the MCU films coming out, and everyone is, is uh, better than the last. I mean, Ant Man comes out, and we all loved it. Yeah. Well, loved it. so it's expected now that these movies are going to be beloved and embraced. The problem is they don't have visionaries like Kevin Feige. All of these are corporate decisions being right. made at, at at studios that don't have, you know, they're corporately structured. Sony, it's not like there's some great visionary at Sony going, here's what we're going to do, the way Kevin Feige does right. at, at Marvel. Yeah. And so when they're making these things, like all other movies, they're compartmentalized and there's nobody. Look, Brian Singer knows how to make an X-Men movie. He comes in, he produces X-Men First Class. He comes in, he directs Days of Future Past, knocks it out of the park. He's making an apocalypse movie that's set in the 80s. Right. I mean, Storm with a Mohawk. Storm with a Mohawk was introduced in X-Men, was it 173? In like October, dated October of 83. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's right in there. It's right in somebody's thinking over there, and it's Brian right. Singer and his team. There's nobody thinking that way on these movies. They're, they're done by committee. They're an amalgamation of different interests and different things. They'll never succeed that way. And look, Spider-Man 2... Like you said, made a billion dollars, almost a billion dollars, but they expected it to make even more than it did. But it was a movie that was unsatisfying on every level, even box office. Well, even I think even Amy Pascal would say, you know what, it should have made three hundred million. Money, more. money talks, but also when you take what the the critical destruction of the Amazing Spider-Man two, it doesn't matter if Spider-Man made a billion dollars. I get it, like you know when you get. <laughs> well, no, wait, a minute, right. wait a minute, wait a minute. I'll take that back. Spider-Man two made yeah. a billion dollars. We'll be would, talking yeah, a different right. story today. I'll take that back just a little bit. But uh, with me, because everybody's like, oh, Transformers, it doesn't matter how many people hate it. They're going to make 17 more. Well, of them. look, I mean, so. Transformers 4 made a, a billion shit dollars worldwide. Yeah. yeah. A billion and, dollars. And, and the thing is, that movie was, I admit, I love Transformers Dark the Moon. The whole destruction of Chicago sequence. Yeah, I did too. I thought it was. I, I sat there and like, look, give me big giant robots. They also beating made each Leonard other Nimoy say Star Trek two lines. Uh, I mean, it's, yeah, it's several, come on, it's amazing. Even I, as much as I will give the Transformers movies a pass, well, except for two. Even four was incoherent. I was watching this going, even I found no joy in right. Transformers 4. And I was looking for a sliver of joy. Maybe there was some joy in the farmhouse. Not much. But 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 Spider-Man 2, 
It was so wildly divergent in tone from scene to scene. I, I it was annoying. I'm, I'm, I was annoyed watching Amazing yeah. Spider-Man. I'm the one guy who I didn't hate the Amazing Spider-Man two, but even I, one of the film's defenders, will tell you it was a massive drop in quality. And that goes back to what we're talking about with the analogy with Fantastic Four. The comparison between you know Spider-Man Fantastic Four, I think, is an accurate one. With the Fantastic Four, I don't think it was, it wasn't the $700 million, and it wasn't just the critical reviews. I think what it was was that, you're right, it made a lot of money, but it was not as nearly as much money as they thought it should have made. Right. So now you've got this trajectory. I talk a lot about trajectories in box office. We got this trajectory. Okay, this one made $700 million. Okay, and it's getting completely panned by audiences and critics. Some of us didn't mind it, but... For the, for, on the on whole, really getting trash. Therefore, the the suits at at Sony can sit back and go, okay, well then, if this is the trajectory and this movie just got slammed, what's going to happen if we put out another one? Now, to correct something you said earlier, Sony did not give Spider Man back to Marvel. Sony still owns Spider Man. Sure, sure. Uh, but but you're right. It was the total crux of what made them go, okay. Let's make this deal with Marvel. Let's get let's reboot Spider Man again. And you know what? This, this could be part of what, what gave the Marvel deal its legs. If they go, we got to reboot Spider-Man again, but we've already rebooted Spider-Man, how's this going to fly? What if we make a deal with Marvel? That gives us a perfect excuse to reboot the character again. There we go. Now Spider-Man can show up in the Marvel films. We can use other Marvel B characters in our Spider-Man movies that we produce. And it was just a win-win, a good social media. But you're absolutely right. It was because Spider-Man 2 was a disappointment. And because if it wasn't, it'd be a totally different landscape. Well, that's the only way I think a Fantastic Four 2 will happen is if they allow Kevin Feige and the team over at Marvel to come in to Fox and take care of the Fantastic Four. I, I here's what I, Four? Uh, what I think is different is what you mentioned earlier, those two words, Brian Singer. What I think they should do is look, like the way Fox operates is a lot different than the way Marvel Disney operates. Now Marvel is a, you know, owned by Disney, but Disney has given Kevin Feige and his team the ability to run that Marvel universe, to run the cinematic universe. He still has to answer to Horn and to sure. Iger and all that kind of stuff. Of too, course. But. but that's the thing. You've got at least one person who's like, all right, I'm getting information from all these people and disseminating it to my group of people who are working on all these different films, phase one, phase two, phase three, phase four. We've got everything working in concert. With something like Fox, you have a bunch of crazy, weird executives who are all just kind of power hungry. That's what I read out of it. It's like, I don't read a unified group. I read like, hey, look, you got Singer's Camp. You got Laurel Shuler Donner. She's like really smart. She's running a good X-Men. She's got the, you know, she's got that going great. She's got Wolverine. She's got Gambit. She's got all these different characters. You got Deadpool's involved in that somewhere, you know, but then you have Fantastic Four, still Fox, but has nothing to do with it except Simon Kinberg. Well, but Fox does have a finished Fantastic Four versus X-Men screenplay. It's already been written, and apparently it's quite good. But I'm not going to say who wrote it and why I know that. Well, uh, that you know that is good enough for me, because <laughs> what I am going to say is like the, Brian Singer already mentioned, hey, we're maybe talking about doing this crossover thing, and then Fantastic Four yeah, bombs. Yeah, we talked about that a few weeks ago. And then ago. they're like, oh, look, it's in different pocket universes. You know, come on. You know, you didn't even have to say that. No. But you're I right. Hate, Fox I, as if they make... know what a pocket universe yeah, they, is. They, they don't <laughs> yeah, even know. I read, they, I read that well, burn comic with the villains. The party, yeah. yeah, come on. Yeah. You are right, though. I, I think what you're saying makes perfect sense. Fox, at some point, needs to take some... I won't mention any of the executives of Fox by name, but right. they'll know who they are. They need to step the fuck out mm -hmm. and just say, you know what? Let, let's let our producers do their producing, and then let's, let's get a Brian Singer and say, Brian, we've got an awful lot of Marvel characters in our house. Will you please shepherd this? Right. Because you're right. I was talking to Kevin Feige one time, and when he showed up, he was like, seriously, I just put the final, this is just before Ant-Man came out, I just gave the final okay 20 minutes ago to the final Ant-Man trailer, and then I was on the golf cart coming here on the phone with Doctor Strange meetings. And then, I, I, walking from the golf cart to come in here with, me, with you, we were talking about Captain America 3. So it's like, it's like you got one guy where this one coherent vision goes through. Yes, he has to answer to the execs at Disney just like everybody else, mm -hmm. but they allow him to all run through that, give one coherent vision to everything, and let it go. Brian Singer has proved to you that he's the guy to do it. X-Men 1, X-Men 2, produce, producer on, you were pointing out, first class, first class first and class. then he directed Days of Future Past. He's the guy. Let's just hope he doesn't give us X-Men and the Beanstalk 
and you know, and we'll, <laughs> and we'll be totally right, look, fine. Yeah, I mean, but that's what happens with everybody's career. You have, even if you have a whole bunch of amazing films, there's a couple of stinkers that fit. Well, in even there, that, you, know, you like, know, Jack the Giant Slayer was a film also done by I think Committee. It was, yes. they didn't know what it was going to be, and I think Brian's heart was in the right place. And there's actually a lot of stuff to like in that movie. Again, I just don't I think won't it's, defend that movie. It's garbage. I'm not <laughs> it's horrible. I'm not going to say it's, it's horrible. Film. I'm not going to say it's horrible. I sat through it's that piece just... of stinky. It's worse than I Frankenstein. No, it's not. <laughs> okay, it's, come it's on. Nothing not. is worse than I Frankenstein. No, no, no. I'm just saying. But again, you film. need that was a film that I think suffered by it was made by committee. And you need a visionary to come in. And I'm sure there's somebody in Hollywood that loves the Fantastic Four that has to be allowed to come in and do that. Right. Look, you got to do it like now with the amount of money it made. Look at Deadpool. Let's see what Deadpool does, because that's really interesting. Right. A film that was made for a price, but it's based on a beloved Marvel character. If it does well and is successful, why not come in, do Fantastic Four for a price now? You're going to have to. You're not going to spend $200 million on a Fantastic oh, Four no. movie. Well, no. I think what you have to do with this Fantastic Four is bury it. And that's how I feel about it. Yep. It's like it's not like you can make a sequel with Miles Teller. And this is done. So if it's a pocket universe, that pocket universe exists in somebody else's pocket. And if they're going to, if Fox is going to maintain we're doing a sequel to Fantastic Four, it's going to have to be a reboot, just like they've done the Punisher. They rebooted that. They did a Punisher right. War Zone. Hey, it's a different Punisher. We're just we're just making a different movie with the, the character of the Punisher, but it's a totally different origin, different everything. You can do that. And we're used to it by now. We've had how many different Supermans? We've had how many different Batmans? We've, well, I mean, we're going to have to eventually get used to having a different Iron Man. Yeah. I know it's going to suck. But you pointed out, man, that this was their fourth try. This was their fourth try. They got one of two choices here, the way I see it, and I think mm -hmm. the way you guys will see it as well. Number one, um, s reboot this thing again. Give it all to Brian Singer. Set Brian Singer up as your new czar of, of your Marvel properties and let and then let them try to make something work out of this. But that's not even the option I would go with. The, op the other option I would go with is, look, three strikes and you're out. And this is four strikes. Uh, it's time to let Fantastic Four go. You just lost your shirts on this one. Clearly, you don't know what you're doing with this property. So if you're not just going to give it and entrust it to a guy like Brian Singer or somebody else like that who's who you've got in your stable and has already proven they can do it, it's time to just bite the bullet and just let it go, and, and just let the rights lapse go back to Marvel. I don't want it at Marvel. I don't. I, I don't want Fantastic Four at Marvel. I've got a creative But it's time team. to let it go. I've got a Fox. Here, here's, if I was an executive at 20th Century Fox, and they tasked me today, they came and they said, Rob, you get one shot at making a Fantastic Four movie, and you got to bring in somebody that Fox is Fox-friendly, I would bring in Alex Garland to write it. Mm. He wrote Dread. He just recently wrote and directed Ex Machina, and sure. I would have Danny Boyle. Danny Boyle, who made that's, Slumdog that, Millionaire, who made mm. Sunshine. Danny Boyle, who made 28 Days Later. He loves genre films. He loves non-genre films. The Danny Boyle, Alex Garland team would knock Fantastic Four out of the I park. I am going to back you up on that. I that think would, that's, that a would great, be impressive. that's a great See, and that's why team. I should actually be running Hollywood, because I, right. I can come up with these things off the top of my head. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to vouch for you as the next Hollywood mayor. If you mayor can. I'm Hollywood. telling you, Alex Garland to write, maybe even Alex Garland to write and direct. Sure. Look at Ex Machina, although uh, you don't want to go heavy. Danny Boyle could bring the levity to it. Garland would write the kick-ass script because Dread, his Dread script was amazing. Hey, look, I'd say Matthew Vaughn. Again, another I mean, great choice. He's someone who brought so much fun back to what X-Men wasn't, you know? He brought, like, that new blood back to I what X-Men needed. So... Yeah, I mean, he's, he's busy right now with Kingsman. He's got a lot of other things. I mean, the, what they definitely need is they need someone to take over. I would love it to go back to Marvel, but what you mentioned makes me not want to go back to Marvel because then it's in the... It's, oh, it's Phase 5 or something. I'll, we have won't to see work it for it all years. into the Marvel. You, I would like I to know. See, just make a standalone Fantastic Four movie that's awesome and spin it off into something else. All right, let's move on. Uh Number three, we've got no more DC heroes after Legends of Tomorrow. So CW president Mark Pedowitz stated that there will be no more DC comic shows added to the network anytime soon. Right now they have Flash, they have Arrow, and coming up they have Legends of Tomorrow, which is a whole bunch of other superheroes. So you got you know, series that didn't work, like Constantine. You've got an animated show like Vixen, which will eventually, that character will probably be spun into either Flash or Arrow or Legends of Tomorrow. Uh, and right now, Constantine is doing a, a cameo 
on Arrow, which I thought that's great. That's pretty baller. That's that is. I mean, come you know, on. To a series at the end of the look, we tried doing the 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 version of the comic book Hellblazer. I thought it was great. I I liked the series Constantine. I was I sad do. to see it go, but hey, look, no, you know, it's it's a money game. No one was watching it, so they had to pull it. If he can survive as a character in some of these, you know, show up in Flash or show up in Arrow or show up in Legends of Tomorrow, that's cool. But for the president to say no more hero shows is a little weird. I get it. They don't want it to become like, you know, well, I watch the CW because it's all superheroes 24-7. I don't think it'll ever become that. What do you think of his comments, John? Well, I can see where he's coming from because, well, first of all, with the Constantine show, I didn't like that show. I loved the pilot. Loved the pilot. And I was so excited for the next episode. And they changed the whole show. They it's like this big major storyline they set up in the pilot. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, no, that's gone. They just like wait a minute now. Who's this new girl? She sucks. And and then I I just I I hung in there for about seven episodes and I just couldn't watch it anymore. And I just went back and I watched the pilot again. But I can understand where he's coming from for a couple of reasons. One, I don't think the decision to have no more heroes on television is his decision alone. I think that's partly Warner Brothers saying. You know, you can't touch the real interesting heroes because we, we're going to use them more. Although they're doing Flash and they're doing Arrow, whatever, that's fine. But what I think the main crux of this is them just hedging their bets a little bit, which is, look, we are going to, if Legends of Tomorrow ever happens, if it does, we've got three big superhero shows on our network. And they're probably going to be the three biggest shows on our network because they'll also have uh, Supernatural, they'll have... Uh, uh, a couple other key, they, they, they still got uh, the originals, Vampire Diaries, things like that. But if we get into four or five shows, right, and we put a lot of our eggs in that basket, and then in two years, the superhero genre, the public gets bored of it. Now, I'm not saying it will, but then all of a sudden now they've got four, five, six major shows that are all drying up at the same time. I think three, th I think part of their thing is just, you know what, we'll go three, and they'll, if they do great for us, great. And if things do go south, then it's just three shows. We're still good. So I think this is just a little bit of them hedging their bets, which is not the worst idea in the world. Sure. Look, I think that I think that they're surprised that the CW, they're surprised that The Flash is working as well as it is. They're surprised Arrow still has the numbers. And Legends of Tomorrow is the most insane idea for a superhero show ever. <laughs> I think they're all scared because they're comic book superheroes. If this were a procedural, like CSI Miami, CSI Cyber, CSI, I mean, how many CSI shows have been successful and ran for a decade each? Yep. I really think that there is a prejudice still there's a prejudice against comic book material in general, and it is it is working despite everyone else's. These network executives are surprised that superhero shows work. Just the same way executives and right. other studios are like, do we have to make another superhero show? I mean, do we? Well, yes, you do, because if it's done well, Marvel has proven it can go on and it can endure. And I think doing... If they're done well, great writing, great producing staff, you know, great showrunners. Sure. These shows, it doesn't matter if they are good, people will watch them. I'll say this about Constantine. I thought the last few episodes, I don't know if you saw those, were incredible. I didn't they, get to the last few. They had few. already I, canceled I, it I, at I that ditched. point in time. I watched it later. You know, I'm not one of the, I'm not responsible for it either being canceled or kept around because I watched it all of them at, in almost two days. And uh, I thought the, they brought in the Brujeria and a lot of these other elements that were part of like the Swamp Thing Alan Moore run, which are horrifying and really great and worked really well. And I mean, Constantine is a perfect example of a procedural. Exactly. It is a superhero, uh, you know, a weird dark magic procedural. It didn't work for people. That's why it got canceled. Unfortunately, I thought it was great, but whatever. But like John said, though, when the, when the show first started, Neil Marshall directs the pilot. Mm -hmm. They bring in a big gun who had done Game of Thrones oh, yeah. episodes oh, yeah. and made it, it so made it good. great. And then the writing staff, they didn't know what it was going to be. Yeah. They didn't go back. Look at the Jamie Delano runs of those first Hellblazer, like so the good. Fear Machine and all that stuff. I mean, Hellblazer was a really Newcastle. Remember when they led up to the oh, Newcastle yeah. storyline? Yes. Like, what happened in Newcastle? Well, and then when you know, finally yeah. found out, it was like, that was even worse than I thought. I mean, it was horrifying. And they didn't, that's what they should have done. Yeah. But then the episodes you're watching, the first, I, me too, I'm like, I like the pilot and I'm like, why don't you embrace what the show is? Why do you not 
go back to the source. Because the character's go, so good. Yeah. So good. And yet what they do is they get... They're gonna make a Constantine show. Look, the movie was way better than the what That's that what show was. That's what I was, was. saying too. I know, mean, I was like... digging the movie, and everyone's like, Keanu Reeves can't play John Constantine, but but they were scared of their own source material, yeah. and it showed, and that's why the show failed. Until they went back to yep. like somebody got smart and went, oh, yeah, we'll go to where the character too was introduced late. in Swamp Thing. Yeah. Alan Moore created John Constantine. I know. Too late though. It was already the plug was already pro there. They knew it was over when they were like making those last three. Of course so. they did, but then they wanted to say. We, were, we know what this show was really supposed to be, and here it is. Well, I hope that Legends of Tomorrow is good, and I hope that that's like the new Justice Society, because they're not going to be able to do Justice League, but they're going to have all these other characters who aren't going to be part of the Justice League. So try it out on TV. I think Arrow is going to probably make it to five seasons, and they'll stop it, and they'll bring in, they'll want to refresh it to keep another, you know, at least three shows on. Did you ever think you'd see Vandal Savage on TV? Never. And, and I'll be honest, like, I have a big bad in a, yeah. in a DC Rip Hunter and the Time Master. I mean, I'm looking on. forward to that. I'm looking forward Me to Legends too. of Tomorrow. I want that to be a really fun show. <laughs> I finally started watching Flash. I'm blown away at how amazing it is. It's amazing. It's incredible. I still I, think it's the best. And the, everybody knows how much I like Daredevil. And yet I will say I think the Flash is the best superhero show on TV. And you're saying that the CW executives are surprised by it all, maybe by all the rest of them. But for some reason, this I remember talking to some CW reps before Flash came out. I thought I thought Flash was a stupid idea. I'll admit it. I'll, I'll call myself on it. I thought it was a dumb idea to do as a TV show. I said it would never work. Flash as a TV show will never work. And it is the best superhero show. They believed in Flash. This I remember some of the CW guys were like, you know what? You keep talking. <laughs> this thing is going. We got we got this Grant kid, and he's going to blow people away, and people are going to watch this show, and they're going to love it. I'm like, another exec who doesn't know what the f he's talking Dream. about. You'll see. Well, so also, but the, the Flash succeeds because it works the way a a mundane show would work. You get a charismatic lead actor. I mean, if you were making police procedural with that guy. I mean, right. it would be a great show. Yeah, well, I gotta, and, you're right. And, that's and, a great and, observation. You know, and that's the thing. They've got, that's what television executives understand. You, you've got a great lead. They can see in the pilot that it, there was a great performance to be had there and, and they realized it could work and they're treating it. They're being respectful to the subject matter, but they're also not, they're not dumbing it down. It's not, the attitude isn't, well, this is just a comic book. No, no, no. And it's that's, not. I mean, that's the problem. Anybody who falls into the trap, like, we don't have to, it's just a comic book. We don't have to treat it. You have to treat comic books the same way you would treat Annie of Green Gables, mm. you know, or even Harry Potter. You got to go back to the source material and take it seriously and make it on that level. And they are. Well, I think also the, the, the core team is Greg Berlanti and, Jeff Johns, who's a right. true sweaty, he's like running DC right now, and he's writing this, writing a lot of the episodes of The Flash, and it shows. And oh, he wrote Flash comic books. No, I know that's what I'm saying. <laughs> you know, really, I mean, but the 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 crossover from doing a comic book to doing a TV show is quite different, and he's succeeding because watching those episodes, I watched them all on a plane on my way to to uh, Australia. So I watched all. The only they only had five available. I so probably you just watched, watched them. <laughs> I just watched them five in a row, and I was like. A couple of them got me all emotional. I was like, I can't believe I'm I'm feeling emotional while I'm watching The Flash. And Rob which... and I were just telling them that, believe it or not, the first five episodes are the worst episodes. Those are like, <laughs> yeah. It does nothing but get better I can't from wait there. to watch the rest of them. So I'm really excited. Let's move on to something I call minor mutations. We're going to go over a whole bunch of little short stories, and we're going to comment on them. So number one, we've got Evangeline Lilly talking about the Wasp returning and you know her her brand new outfit and whether she's going to fit in it to, or not we've got number two we've got wolverine three uh you got you jackman talking about berserker rage you got professor x maybe saber is going to show up uh we've got the joker this rumor going around that the joker might possibly be jason todd in the batman v superman or suicide squad whatever Let, we'll talk about that idiot idea in a second it is the blob going to be an x-men apocalypse it seems like he is from uh, from the casting and uh, Doctor Strange production artwork. We're gonna have John Campia talk about what he saw at D twenty three. Let's talk about these in a quick fashion. Uh, what what sticks out to you, Robert? In these, this well, you know, I think that the the Wolverine three. I'm excited about it. It's funny. I was not a big fan of the Wolverine solo films, but right. there's good stuff in them. Right. They've talked about the old man Logan storyline. I think that the the third Wolverine movie is probably gonna be the best. I mean, it's probably the last time we're going to see Hugh Jackman play Wolverine, right. and I think he's going to want to go out on a high note. I think it's going to be the skyfall, dare I say it, of Wolverine movies. And um, whether Sabretooth is going to be in it again, 
I really liked the relationship with Sabretooth in the first uh, Wolverine movie. I thought that actually worked kind of well. It was just, again, the tone was wildly divergent, but there was a lot of good stuff in it. Mm -hmm. And of course, Professor X should be in it because I want to see that relationship develop. The rela relationship we saw, we saw in Brian Singer's first Wolverine X-Men movie, the Wolverine Professor X relationship began the crux of that film when, sure. when Wolverine first wakes up in the, the mansion, you know, and, and uh, Wolverine didn't know who he was and it was Professor X who helped him. Let's see that. Let's see that mentor student relationship taken further. I'd love to see that. John, what sticks uh, out to you? The two things that stand out to me, one is the whole Jason Todd thing. And look, I, I've, I talked about this on a mailbag episode about a month ago. I do not believe that the Joker was Robin. Now, whether it's Jason Todd, whether it's Dick Grayson, whether it's Tim Drake, whether it's any of them, mm -hmm. okay? I don't think it is. But this is one of those stupid rumors that I will say I'm not going to fall over a shock if it does turn out to be true. I think Warner Brothers has been showing they want to do a lot of things different with this new DC Cinematic Universe they got going. I know they call it the DC Extended Universe, but screw them, it's a cinematic universe. So <laughs> um, this rumor is one I am not going to dispel out of hand. I don't think it's true. I don't think that, I, I, I think it's going to be just, he's the Joker. But, um, th but this new picture that everybody's talking about that brings up the rumor again, is that look, in the, in the Robin costume that's in the glass case in the trailer, there's two little holes on the show, looks like bullet holes. And if you look at the picture of Jared Leto there holding his head screaming, it looks like maybe there might be scar marks on his shoulder. So there you go, two bullet holes. Okay, first of all, um, it, yeah, it does look like those could be scar tissue, but it also looks like they could be just shadows. Uh, on his shoulder. So that's nothing. Also, the bat, the Robin costume, I would give more weight to this argument if the Robin costume was perfect condition just with two holes in the shoulders. If you look at that Robin costume, there are holes and rips right. and slices all and over. everything all over the place. So it's like, why would it just be the two little pieces of scar marks? So I don't give it that. The Doctor Strange stuff. Kevin Feige comes on on stage and says, look, we haven't started shooting Doctor Strange, so we got nothing to show you. But how can we come to D23 and not show you something? I wish Lucasfilm had listened to him. But anyway, how can <laughs> we come to D23 and not show you something? So what he did was he took the production art, took a whole ton of production art, put music to it, and just went through these images with this dramatic music playing, and it play, It felt like a trailer, and it looks so crazy. It looks so wild, like multiple dimension jumping, following the classic story that we get in the Marvel animated Doctor Strange film, following that classic one. He's the most world-renowned neurosurgeon, gets in a car accident, crushes both of his hands, he bankrupts himself trying to find ways to fix his hands, finally goes on a worldwide pilgrimage trying to find alternative things, like maybe spiritual means, fix it, comes across the ancient one, and then everything else starts to ensue. It looks brilliant. I cannot wait to see what they do. So those are the ones that stand out to me. Right on, how about you? Well, I mean, I think what you were just saying I, you know, the Jason Todd thing, I discounted it, but there's stuff in the Batman versus Super, Batman v Superman Dawn of Justice trailer that glimpses of, you know, the raw, like you were talking about, the mm -hmm. Robin suit. It's interesting, Batman's in Suicide Squad. I mean, if they're trying to build a cinematic universe, that's an interesting tie in. And it's not like Jason Todd, we didn't see him again in the DC universe. So right. interesting. I mean, I don't know. I mean, does that, does that, denigrate the joker by making him part of the batman family i mean is that a weird thing or is there going to be like is he anakin skywalker right is the joker now the dc equivalent of darth vader who was once uh, an impressionable young child who was led bravo the for the path. analogy fabulous you know, analogy. i mean I love that he one. raises well up and he's darth vader you know i don't know but i think it's interesting i think it's an interesting thing i who knows? I think it's the worst idea ever in the whole universe <laughs> of any DC extended anything that the Joker was Jason Todd. I think it's it's like I'll I will sell you a moon picture where I could say, look at the weird shadow. Obviously, we never landed on the moon. Or look at this Kennedy assassination picture. There were seven people. If you connect these weird dots by a dumb fan who's who noticed a shadow somewhere, it's ridiculous. I just like tell you right straight up. I think I'm it's not stupid. saying it's real, but it could be cool if they did it right. Look, they did it right with Hush. That was uh, yes, but that's my point. But to combine the Joker and do this kind of look, I mean, 
you can never say 100% I agree with you. They've done it. They did it with Batman. They made the Joker responsible for Batman's origin because the Joker killed his family in the original Tim Burton Batman movie. So you created me. I created you first. So if they're going to go back to this kind of weird thing like the, the Joker blaming Batman, you created me. I don't know. I really highly doubt it you know i'm even saying stuff that's making me think maybe they are going to do it but <laughs> i think it'd be a really stupid idea i think it's just like it's it's the joker exists without batman it just makes him more powerful as a villain that he doesn't have to have been look i agree with batman. you I, I do agree with you but but there could be that kind of thinking going on you know if they're it, trying to build this extended interconnected universe i mean it's just it, it was interesting to me to see batman and suicide squad like why do that they're just. I know they want well, to how connect. Does, how does the Joker send a picture to Bruce Wayne? Like, unless he knows that Bruce Wayne is Batman. Remember that picture well, in yeah, the trailer? And yeah, she's, right. You, I, you yeah. let your family die, and on top of that, think about this too. One of the problems we've always faced cinematically with with the Joker, who is the most iconic of all the Batman villains, undoubtedly, is. The Joker poses no real physical threat to Batman. You can't have a climax in a scene where it's in a an old steel mill factory with fire raging all over the thing, and they're facing off, and now it's good. it ends tonight, and they go out. That, that's a one-second fight. That's right. Ronda Rousey fighting any of us at the table. It's over before it starts. If he was Tim Drake, if he was Dick Grayson, if he was Jason Todd, that means you got a dude who can go toe to toe with Batman and fight Batman. Now suddenly we got a joke. That brings a new element to the Joker as well. Again, I'm with these guys. I don't believe that's what's happening, but it raises some interesting possibilities if they wanted to go that direction. I would also argue now against him being Jason Todd because why would Batman have that outfit sitting in a memorial suit if Holds he's still alive. Holds himself responsible, maybe, for something like, really no, bad No, because happened. like when Ben Kenobi lies to Luke Skywalker about how his father, he was the best star pilot in the galaxy and a cunning warrior. He was. But 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 he, he, he neglects but he to wasn't mention dead. He that wasn't he falls dead. from grace and became... Yeah. Enough like, of these Star Wars Darth Vader I'm analogies. Saying, it's I wrong. Mean, it's not I mean, happening. I mean, Batman knows it's, it's a counsel. reminder. He has <laughs> that in his cave, and he's like, every day I cannot allow what happened to Jason Todd to happen to anyone else. No. Well, you know, I'm still going to argue the case that you're going to see uh, Jason Todd getting beaten to death by the Joker in a flashback sequence while Batman's, ta ta you know. Or when another they, one of the Robins. Right. Or another one of the Robins. I'm on your side. I, yeah. I think Me we're too. all on the same side. Yeah, no, we are. But, but exploring but the possibilities. It's an interesting possibility. Yeah. You know, I'm not going to say it's not interesting if they pull it off right, but I think it's stupid. So I'm going <laughs> to stick to it until I all find right. out otherwise. Uh, let's move on to our flashback segment. It's uh, this week. We're going to talk about the movie V for Vendetta. Now, it came out in 2006. It's based on Alan Moore and David Lloyd's amazing graphic novel about revolution in the, a futuristic United Kingdom. The Wachowski brothers, the Wachowski siblings, delivered a, a faithful film, and it was directed by James McTeague, a guy that they've worked with on a lot of other films. Um, I, for one, personally thought this was a really great film. Not only just an adaptation of a comic book series that I loved, but it was also really strong in that they stayed faithful not only to the comic book series, but to the core ideas of what it takes to actually have a real revolution, which to have a real revolution means you're going to have to sacrifice quite a lot. Uh, as uh, the character played by Natalie Portman found out, as we all found out, the transformation from her, uh, from her becoming a becoming a revolutionary by being trained by the, 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 the V is all we know his name right. is. What did you guys think about this film? Oh, it's, I really like the film a lot. And not, it, I think the first time I saw it, I didn't even remember it was a comic book adaptation. I mean, it's just that good. And look, it, what gave a lot of weight to it was a little bit of a dread thing going on. You never saw V's face. All you do is you have Agent Smith, Lord Elrond behind the mask, doing the voice, Hugo Weaving, doing the voice, when he brought so much to that character with just his voice, which is, you know, I, I think... Just one of the really key smart things they did in the film, and, and it was faithful. That was faithful to the to the source material as well. But it had a little bit of 1984 in it. Right, it had a, a little bit of fantasy in it. It had like a noir feel to it at the same time. It was colorful yet dark. It 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 just did a lot of things really really well. And it's one of those films that I that I had walked away from going that was just a solid movie. Well, you know, I mean, I I I'm a huge Alan Moore acolyte and fan. But I thought that when I read V for Vendetta, when DC brought it back and republished it right. in the United States, I thought it was murky. The way it looked was murky. I mean, it, the artwork was murky. But I liked the story. Mm -hmm. And I think the movie does 
as good a job of conveying Alan Moore's story. I think it's incredibly faithful to what he was doing. Like you said, it goes back to the, the gunpowder plot and the whole remember, remember, you know, yeah. the 5th of, the November. 5th of November. And, 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 and we don't know that. Like, it's not an American thing. It's a right. British thing. We didn't, we didn't have that, you know, Guy Fawkes Day right. and all that. But I think it, it was a fantastically faithful adaptation. And it's a great science fiction movie. You know, there's even allusions to the Holocaust in it. Right. And I think it's it's one of the better dystopian science fiction films we've seen in the last 15 years. And it honors Alan Moore's words. I, I think it's a great piece of work. Yeah, I also think anyone who hasn't seen it now, now more than ever, V for Vendetta is important for you to watch uh, because of our <laughs> political climate here in America. <laughs> Check out this film, you know, and you might feel a little... A little something going on in there. Right. Uh, let's move on to uh, uh, Spotlight, which is a, basically a comic book that has not been turned into a movie or a television series. So this week, I'm picking Hard Boiled. It's a 1990 comic book written by Frank Miller and drawn by the incredible, super dense, super amazing Jeff Darrow. This science fiction, ultra-violent, heavy metal freakout is all I could say. It was came out as three issues, then came, you know they put all that together into... An amazing uh, orgasm of the eye and mind is all I could say. It's like so incredibly dense. The artwork is so detailed. There's these double page spreads of cars going through a supermarket <laughs> with just bodies and explosions and every single label. There's different, uh, you know, this that's a detergent. That's beans. That's I mean, Jeff Darrow's artwork is just magnificent. Just to behold on its own with no story. And this, let's be honest, it's a very loose story. It's basically a guy <laughs> who's like, I'm a, a real a real estate agent, I'm a tax agent, I don't know what I am, wait a minute, I'm a robot. It's like, that's, I just ruined the whole story for you, but it takes 96 <laughs> pages. I'm a robot. 96 pages for you to realize this, and it's incredible. Now this is, a, this is just so beautifully drawn that it's like something that, I mean, I would love to see this as an action-packed two-hour film. Just straight up adapting this art, just go right from this and just make that. What do you guys think about this comic book series, Robert? Well, like the Wachowski brothers doing something of that visual, you come up with bullet time, but destructo time. Exactly. The way you can see that. And if you could do that, you know, people forget that Frank Miller had really, he had Ronin, yep. he had Give Me Liberty, yep. and he had this. He had Hard Boiled. And Rusty, the big Oh, boy. that's right. And Rusty, that's big right. Guy. That's right. These science fiction visions where he took science fiction tropes and and exploded them in different ways i mean sci-fi ninjas and wrote uh, and ronin mm -hmm. and then he did you know a, a minority revolutionary and we Give talked Me about Mar martha washington last week yeah. oh you did yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. or so, two weeks ago oh i i, I didn't I didn't know that. Right on. But but I, I think this fits into that pantheon of like the, the killer robot genre that yeah. it, and it goes back to it has elements of British stuff from uh, 2000 AD like even Judge Dredd with the totally. mega cities and it's got a lot of Japanese anime influence it's got a, it feels like Akira at some point oh, yeah. I mean that kind of urban destruction where the entire city is going up in flames with you know nuclear it's almost like he it's almost like he's his own nuclear bomb. Totally. And, and and going through and, and the devastation, it's so much fun to like look at these pages. You want to see him? Didn't they do a, a a big version of this? Like a big oversized oh, yeah. hard boil. I got it. You got the oversized. Yeah, I got hard -boiled. sweaty and got all every you version got, of yeah, hard boil. Yeah, you got sweaty. It's. I mean, it's the thing is, you need to get multiple copies because you will sweat all over them yeah. as you turn the pages because they're so. It's They're fantastic exciting. artwork. They're what do you exciting. think about Hard Boiled, John? Just to clarify for everybody, do not be mistaken between Hard Boiled and the feature film Hard Boiled. Right. You'll be very disappointed. It is not the <laughs> John Woo you, Hard Boiled. It's not. not. Which is John also Woo amazing. Film, which is, well, yeah, look at yeah. which cover we have up there. Yeah. I mean, that's that an incredible. You'd also cover. actually be a little bit forgiven if you thought you looked at the cover and thought, well, maybe this is the John Woo. No, no, no. no. Well, the, the best <laughs> word I've always used to describe this graphic novel is spastic. Yeah. In the sense that every once I just feel myself, whoa, like, whoa, you're right. Not the way you let off. It's not like the smoothest story that runs through. But that almost plays to its strength in a totally. way. It's just so, and it, it's hog, it's, it's violent, but it's visionary. It's it's all that kind of stuff rolled into one. And yes, this, I don't always think the, the, the ones you bring in the spotlight would make good movies. This would make a fun movie directed by John Woo. This would be a great movie. Oh, that's <laughs> actually a great idea. <laughs> I think John Woo's retired. So no, <laughs> he's no? making great historical epics in China. Oh, yeah. Red Cliff or whatever. Multi-part epics. Yeah, I don't know. I wouldn't bring him on to this one. I would. <laughs> this would be something that I'd like to see a young director tackle. Like just I somebody agree. who's like hungry and wants or, to like really work really or, hard. 
George Miller's follow up to Fury Road. George Hard Miller boiled. would kill this. this kill would, it. If he wasn't doing Man of Steel 2, this would be the most fantastic thing that he. Oh, did I just spoil something? Um, <laughs> this would be amazing for him to direct. I would love to see someone of that caliber direct this film. That's what you want. So let's let's uh, let's move on to something that's a bit sad. Uh, a guy passed away this week that I want to bring some attention to and just give a moment of silence to. Uh, his name was Le Lenny B. Robinson, and uh, he's a guy who would just dress up as Batman, and he would uh, spend his time going to. Uh, hospitals where sick kids were and he would you know show up as batman and tell them stories about batman and then give them toys as batman and he did this just because he he did a bunch he got a lot of money in real estate and just was like this is what i want to do on my spare time drove around in like kind of a cool lamborghini he got famous a few years ago for getting pulled over by the cops and that video got released on youtube and so he got famous for that but then you know that fame also th then let a lot of people into his life and they realize oh, he does this all the time every day he's making sick kids happy unfortunately his, he had car problems a day or two ago and his he got hit by a uh, by mistake his car got hit by another car and he got hit by his own car and died so i just wanted to give a, a moment of uh, silence to someone who's just doing what they could as a real superhero which is like giving kids dreams especially sick kids something to think about and be happy about while they're in a hospital so uh definitely give uh lenny b robinson a few moments of your time right now And uh, let's move on to Twitter questions. Uh, today we've got a question from Steven, and he asks, how many times have you seen the Deadpool trailer, and do you have a box office prediction for it? So what do you guys think, John? Deadpool, how many times have you seen that trailer? Uh, I've probably seen it about a dozen times. Right? Like, I watched it about five or six times when it first got released online, then every couple of days I'll watch it again. Sure. Whatever. Box office prediction is tough. It's really tough. This is going to be a, an R-rated film. And let's face it, as popular as Deadpool is amongst the comic book fans, he's not a super well-known character amongst those who are not. Tough one to peg. But if it, it – and, and we haven't heard the early reviews yet. And when is it? It's coming out when? What's the – February, if I'm not mistaken. Okay. I mean, uh, fact checker Wendy, can you just double check that? She's nodding her head at me. But just give me a thumbs up if it is or a thumbs down if it's not. Um, I believe it's February. And February is an interesting time of year for it right. to come. Actually, it's a really good time of year for Deadpool. That's, that's a nice area. I think a nice, safe place to put it. I'm going to say if the early reviews are good and whatever, I think it can do 50 million opening weekend. I think I think it can do straight out of Compton. And I'm getting the thumbs up. Yes, it is coming out in February. Right on. Robert? I'm going to say 85 to 125 million. Opening I, weekend. Opening, not opening weekend. No, total. Total okay. domestic oh, box uh, office. I was about to fall into my chair. Total <laughs> domestic box office, 85 to 125 million. I've seen the trailer quite a few times. Uh, I really like the take on the character, I mean, the Merc with the Mouth, is, 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 is he's there. It's It depends. Again, is the whole movie good? Is it going to sustain? I mean, they're, they're coasting on their glib funniness. Right. You know, I want to know that it's got a great plot. It's got a great story that you can get engrossed in. Uh, it looks like it does. I think Ryan Reynolds really has a lot riding on this movie, so he's probably made sure that all the creative team is uh, on the same page, if they can be. Um, and if it is good, I think it bodes well for the future of, I want to see a Moon Knight movie. I'd love to see an R-rated Moon Knight movie. And I'm hoping if this is good, we might see one. I'm going to say, do you want to revise yours? Because if we're going to go full box office, what do you uh, think? No, I'll, I'll stick with my opening weekend. Full box office, we'll, we'll have to you see know, how the audiences respond to it, all that kind of stuff. But I think with the marketing campaign they're doing, if it's a strong word of mouth coming out of the critics early, I'll stick with my with my straight out of Compton money, and I'll say around the $50 million mark. Yeah, I'd say 35 to 50. Straight out of Compton, weekend. they revise it. It was actually made 60. 60. Oh, 60 yeah, 60 million. on the... I think it was 58. They right. revised it up to 60. But, yeah. you know, Deadpool doesn't have a lot of albums that people love. <laughs> right? Well, hey, look, I think, I think the marketing strategy that they've done with Deadpool is incredible. And I think that the word of mouth now, with as it slowly builds to its release... It's going to I think it's going to break 70 million opening weekend. I think it's going to be 300 over 300 million just domestically. 
Is oh, I think, come on. Come on. Yep. No way. Sorry, that's what I'm saying. Come 300 on. million do you know how yep. many films make 300 million domestically? Not like, a lot. Next to none. But the, Deadpool the, you will. Know what? Parents, this, this is going to be like when the PMRC was coming out against certain record, you know, when, uh, when back in the 80s. I think parents are going to be appalled by this movie. I think there's going to be a backlash, which is what they're planning All on. All the more reason that it's going to make money. I mean, maybe they'll do the new trailer with uh, Fuck the Police or something. Yeah, they'll well, put some NWA in NWA there. Get an NWA song in there. All of a sudden, we're talking gold. So, you know, hey, call me crazy. Or platinum. Platinum. Let's move on to the next question. We've got uh, Colt Bodo. Boda, I don't know if I'm slaughtering your name, says, should Marvel introduce Carol Danvers, Miss Marvel, or Captain Marvel first? Would a Kamala Khan, Miss Marvel TV show work? What do you guys think about all these Marvel women? I think everybody ju just gets far too ahead of ourselves to start. Look, we've got one movie coming, right. and it's going to be Captain Marvel, and we already know it's going to be Carol Danvers. Right. So let's... Let that breathe a little bit before we start talking. Now, can we have a different version of Ms. Marvel? And can we do a TV show? And we, uh, let's let's just get Ms. Marvel out there first, and right. let's talk in 2019. Or Captain Marvel. Or Captain just, Marvel, yeah. I'm stoked to see Carol Danvers, because isn't isn't Avengers Annual 10 one of your favorite comic books <laughs> of all? I mean, Rogue's first introduction and Carol Danvers and all. I love that. I, I want to see... I don't think they could incorporate that into the actual Marvel Universe. No. Rights problems. Right. But, I mean, Michael Golden drew that comic, Avengers Annual 10, everyone. Mm -hmm. If you want to get one comic that's awesome that you can still get cheap, that's a good one. Yeah, and Michael Golden, fantastic artist oh, if you've never seen his stuff. He drew Micronauts. Micronauts. Amazing. But, I, I look, I, I think that they're going to do... Again... Everyone's like, every time a new Marvel movie is announced, people are like, ugh, this one's going to be the one where they fail. Well, it's going to be awesome. Right? It's going to be awesome. Yeah. I, I mean, it's Captain Marvel. It's gonna be, she's going to be hot. They're going to have the Kree in it. I mean, it's I, like. I mean, it's going to be great. And you know what? It's going to pass the Bechtel test. That's I right. I bet you it's yeah. going to pass the Bechtel test. Let people know what the Bechtel test is. Well, it's, it's a movie where, where two women have to talk to each other and not about men. Yep. And yeah, well, then, yeah, it's 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 uh, it's, a, it's a film that has scene without men in it, with multiple female characters only in the scene, and they don't have con and their conversation does not revolve around men. I think Captain and, Marvel will do that. Yes, and I do pass too. that in flying colors. He, people people always underestimate because it's a shared universe. There's all these other characters and other. I mean, they've already established this ama amazing rich universe that now Carol Danvers is going to be part of. So. Right, and who knows who's a friend of hers. In the Marvel Cinematic Universe. We don't know. Maybe she's going to be in Civil War. Who knows? Let's move on. Simon's got a question. Simon says, do you guys think we will see the crime syndicate in the DC Cinematic Universe? Extendo Universe. What do you think? The crime okay. syndicate. Can I just say that the crime syndicate, that would be Earth 3. And, and uh, you know, the, 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 the evil versions of the Justice League. One of my favorite things in the world i remember yeah. the first time i saw the crime syndicate was one in one of those giant size hundred page you know it was a reprint it was mm -hmm. a, it was the crime syndicate reprint dollar comic yeah the books, dollar yeah. comic books and it was like i, I want to say it was number 114 or 115 or something and mm -hmm. my mother i only read justice League of america comics when i was like eight and my mother bought them all for me and i remember the ultra man you know and 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 power ring mm -hmm. and, i mean i i can't wait to see the crime syndicate, but it's never going to happen, ever. Ditto. It happens in the animated series, right? you know, but yeah. no, 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 no. And the great Earth Two graphic, graphic novel, right? Uh, yeah, never I don't. Gonna happen. I don't think it's going to happen in the Justice League movie or the Justice League number two film. But if they somehow get to Justice League number five, this is in twenty years, perhaps. That's all I could say. I don't it's know. Like, it's, it's just. I don't think so. It's You're such right. a look, guys. I love the crime syndicate, but there are things that you just. Are, they're just not going to translate into the real world. Yeah. But then again, I thought that about Ant-Man. Yeah, you never know. I thought that I, about I, The Flash. I'll never say but never. But in Legends of Tomorrow, you might see him on TV. Sure. That's where that the could, crime syndicate You could get the crime up. syndicate in some weird they, way. Yeah, there could be a dimensional rip and they show yeah. up. That'd be the perfect place to put him. Yeah, and uh, what's his name? Rip Hunter can put him there. Right, you know? that's right. All right, let's go on to the next question. Bryn H Hanna says... How does it feel to know New Line and Tom Hardy are listening to your ideas on Collider Heroes? Because we talked about 100 Bullets, you know? Right. And we've talked about Nemesis, and now both of those films are in active. The Warner Brothers brought Nemesis over. Now we got Tom Hardy revealing that 100 Bullets is actually going to be a movie. It's exciting. 
and you guys should listen to more of our great ideas because you're <laughs> stupid if you don't because we're we're real comic book nerds who are actually television and fan films and we're also making stuff so you should be listening to us we spent our lives doing it i can't wait till they release the the news that alex garland is going to write the new fantastic <laughs> four movie that's right. and terry is going to direct yeah. it phone calls are being made yeah. as we speak but i think it's cool why shouldn't I mean, in terms of pundits or, or the voice of the times, I mean, you guys have been setting the tone, and you obviously know your stuff. Why not listen to you guys? You're basically giving a – there's a development plate right here every week on Collider yeah. Heroes, and you guys are just giving it all away for free. All you so stupid, these development yeah, executives, you stupid these executives were giving you amazing I, ideas. You could take credit for people. them. They're like, man, I don't know anything about this. You guys got to watch Collider. Yeah, I know. That's the that's the thing that's getting whispered around. It's like I don't know. I don't read comics, they and I, set, I feel very ashamed. Here, just re watch this show. These guys will set you straight. <laughs> you know, they have Wednesday morning meetings at all the studios after they've seen the show, and they they're <laughs> like, right. "Well, what are we going to talk about today?" You know, we're really going to talk about hard boiled. Frank Miller's <laughs> hard boiled. I that's mean, right. Next well, week, yeah. the rights get bought. Yep. <laughs> Come on, let's do it. All right. So the next question. Thanks for all you executives who are watching our show and making good decisions. All right. Next question is Andy Ward. Do you think if they release the 1994 version of Fantastic Four, it would get a better response than the 2015 Fantastic Four? No. No. I don't think so. I've seen the original 1994 Fantastic Four film. It's horrible. It's uh, it, the only cool things about it are that they tried doing the John Byrne negative outfits that look horrible. They just like they look like they cost six dollars and felt weird, barely stitched together. Um, Doctor Doom is played by a guy who likes to act with his hands, and everything he says is, "If you would only listen to what I'm saying, because I have a metal mask on <laughs> yeah. my thing, overcompensate." <laughs> yeah. So. Look, I mean, he was. Ha it's very, it's very much like Batman, nineteen sixties. That's how the Doctor Doom character is over the top. Everything is very kind of corny. Um, a lot of people are like, "It's the most loyal film that was made." It's a horrible film. I hate when people use the nineteen ninety four film as this is the true Fantastic Four. It's like, no, it's not. It's like a bad TV film. It's very low budget. The graphics are horrible. It's like three sets. Yeah, they got the the family dynamic correct. They got the origin correct because they made the origin right from the comic book. There are a few things in it that are correct, but the execution of it is really bad. It's just very low budget. It's directed like it's a, you know, like a really low budget film. So there's nothing that I would say, oh, you've got to see this. This is truer to the original Fantastic Four. It's no. just it's just another bad ver movie. What do you think? Robert? I think it's awful. I mean, it's it's cheap. It, it Look, it's not even worth watching. You can sit down and look at it as a curiosity. It's not even a film that that <clears throat> needs to be seen. Right. You don't need to waste your time on it. It's like the holiday. It's the Star Wars. To continue my Star Wars analogy, it's the Star Wars holiday special That's of right. Fantastic Four movies. It certainly is. What it's you, not good. What do you think, John? No, 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 no. I should never see the light of day, and you shouldn't go and watch it. And there's nothing to watch there. And just no. Yeah, I watch know a movie called Inframan. Instead, if you haven't seen a movie called Inframan, The Man Beyond Bionics, the villain's name is Princess Dragon Mom. Go now, find that. Inframan, he has the weird uh, like mask that he wears. And well, he's, he's a like Hong a Kong ripoff of Ultraman <clears throat> that the Shaw Brothers made, mm -hmm. but it's awesome. <laughs> and it's way better than the Fantastic Four movie, Inframan or the Super Inframan. It's on DVD. You know what? I think I saw Inframan when I was a little kid. It was awesome. Yeah, it's, it's, I have an Inframan one sheet in my bedroom, which well. is probably why I'm single. <laughs> <laughs> well, hey, look, you, there is a, a documentary called Doomed, the untold story of the Fantastic Four, which is all about this 1994 film. So, you know, if you want to check out this, you know, the untold story of this Fantastic Four, there's now a documentary that you can check out too and then see the actual film on YouTube. It's available to see. Or, you know, I, it's just, it's a rights issue thing, so they can't actually release this movie. Right. So it becomes that, well, I, I demand to be able to see this film. Really? I don't know if you really want to no. see this film. No, so. you don't. All right. And now that brings us to the last question, which is the sweaty question of the week. It's Mike McHale, and he asks, what are your thoughts on a Herculoids movie? Now, I don't know how many of you guys, have you guys seen the Herculoids? But for me, I loved the Herculoids. I thought it's a it's a weird planet where it's got a little creature that's like a triceratops. It's got gloop and gleep. It's got a giant like, and he shot ice rubber monkey. balls out of his... Yeah, out of his a, thump, yeah. Thump, thump, and they had thump. great toys. Yeah. They, <laughs> they had were Herculoids um, toys. Yes. So I, I think that that, co uh, that cartoon series would make a great, crazy, weird 
movie that nobody would see. Probably me and three <laughs> other people would go see it. Well, but. Again, it, look, it depends how it's done. Right. I mean, if you did it as sort of a crazy animated movie where it was sort of taken seriously, but it was wacky, mm -hmm. or somebody like Miyazaki came along and did a Herculoids movie, right. or, I mean, if you did it like Archer, you know, you could do a Herculoids uh, a series right. like that. But and like tongue-in-cheek Herculoids? Very, yeah, tongue-in-cheek, but make it sort of sophisticated. Make it, make it, if you had somebody, perhaps someone like yourself, who's worked in that kind <laughs> of animation before, and you just admittedly... Executives are going to be calling you because at their Wednesday morning meeting, they're going, you know that John Schnepp, he's going to make a Herculoids movie for Netflix <laughs> or a series. What do you think? Yeah, Would you do it, it? If it was tongue-in-cheek, if it was a return to the cartoon stylings, perhaps. But, yeah, I don't know about making it a, a feature film done all serious, like the Herculoids all dark and serious. You can't. You can't. It's goofy. No, you can't. It's a goofy can't. cartoon show. So what do you think about the Herculoids? No, the, the, no the, you, the, you can't make this. And much hey, this pains me to say it like this, but this is true. And much like other Miyazaki films, nobody in North America watches them. That's true. I, I just don't see an audience go, no matter how you make this film, I don't see it. But I'll tell you this. One of my happiest moments of watching television was watching The Family Guy and they have a Herculoids reference in it, where the the, the creature shows up and everything. Dun, 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 dun. Really? Like, oh yeah, oh yeah, it's in the Family Guy, and that wow. made me so happy when I saw that. It's like, holy crap, I didn't think anybody else remembered these guys. Well, that's the second thing that Seth MacFarlane's ever done right, as far as I'm concerned. He, he produced the Cosmos series, which I was like, hats off to you, and now he did a Hercules reference. reference. Well, he was on a couple episodes of Star Trek Enterprise. <laughs> anyway, Seth MacFarlane, what's going on? Uh, that's it for our show. I'd like to thank our guests, Robert Meyer Burnett. Where can people find you online? Uh, you can find me on Instagram at RM Burnett or on Twitter at Burnett RM or Facebook at Robert Meyer Burnett or at Star Trek And how's that Axonar thing going? We have, our going crowdfunding on campaign ended. Uh, we're almost over $500,000, which is going to allow us to make the first half. Nice. Of Star Trek Axanar. I'm very excited about it. Uh, the script is done. It's amazing. I start directing the uh, visual effects sequences in September. We have our live action shoot in January, and it's it's going to be epic. It's going to be the most difficult, most fun, and challenging, and scary thing I've ever done. But I've spent my life preparing for it. I am so excited for this because I know that he is one of the biggest Star Trek nerds. He's a giant nerd anyway, but I've known him for many years, and this is like a dream come true for yeah. you. If you I'm watch Prelude happy. to Axanar on 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 uh, YouTube, you can check it out. But it's I'm already sweaty about it. I wake up, I sweat at night about it. I get up <laughs> in the morning, I'm having Axanar sweat. <laughs> It's great. We can't wait to see it. John Campia, where can people find you online? Um, you can find me on uh, Facebook and on Twitter, just at John Campia. And, of course, every day, Monday through Friday, you can find me on Movie Talk. And on Thursdays, you can find me on Jedi Council. And I just gave a brief reference to this uh, last week, but I'll let you know that I have my first book coming, and uh, I'm hoping it will be available by Christmas. So, fingers crossed, I'll keep you guys updated on that. Do you have that. a title for it yet? I do, but I'm not sharing All it. All right. Well, <laughs> well What's it about? I am not sharing that yet either. All right. Wow. I'm, I'm very excited. Be, Can I get a gallery? You know what it's about. No, I know. We're, I know. we're not going to talk about it. I'm not going to do it. I'll it's tell you about you. it off air. It's okay. up to him to tell you what it's about. <laughs> well, you guys can find me on Twitter and Instagram, just at John Schnepp and at uh, TDOSLWH. You can find my film, The Death of Superman Lives, What Happened, a documentary about the Nick Cage, Tim Burton, Kevin Smith film from 1998, Superman Lives. Come to www.tdoslwh.com. You can get a digital download or you can buy a Blu-ray. So check that out. Once again, this is Heroes, uh, episode 21. That's what you've been watching, and I'll see you guys next week.